Welcome back to Harbour Unboxed. I hope you're all doing well and you're not sick of second gen Ryzen content just yet because today we have more of it for you. As the title's no doubt given away, we are checking out the Ryzen 5 2600 and we'll be taking it for a spin on the impressive new ASUS ROG Crosshair 7 Hero. It's a $300 US X470 board with all the bells and whistles. It has to be said though that the Ryzen 5 2600 is probably better suited to something like the ROG Strix X470F Gaming or the Prime X470 Pro, given that it is a $200 US processor. The 2600 is $30 cheaper than the 2600X that we looked at last week, and that 13% saving sees the operating clock speeds reduced by 6 to 7%, while the box cooler has been downgraded from the Wraith Spire to the dinky little Wraith Stealth, and we'll check out how that performs later in the video. The real competition though comes from the blue team's Coffee Lake Core i5 range, in particular the Core i5-8400 which comes in almost $20 less. Uh, not a huge saving, but it does make it a little more affordable. The Ryzen 5 2600 does have two distinct advantages though. Firstly, it can be overclocked, and pushing all cores past 4 GHz shouldn't be a problem. Meanwhile, the Core i5-8400 is limited to an all-core frequency of 3.8 GHz. However, perhaps the biggest advantage is the fact that the 2600 is a 6 core 12 thread processor thanks to the inclusion of SMT support. The 8400 lacks Intel's hyperthreading technology, meaning it's a 6 core 6 thread CPU, and this will hand Ryzen a serious advantage in core heavy workloads. AMD's really been aggressive for pricing on the second gen Ryzen CPUs. Last year, the Ryzen 5 1600 launched at $220 US, though it has to be said for most of 2017, it did sell for less than that. And then in early 2018, it was officially discounted to $190 US. So that means when compared to the discounted price, the 2600 is coming in at just a fraction more than the older 1600. Apart from improved IPC performance, greater efficiency, reduced cache latency, enhanced memory latency, and frequency support, the 2600 also comes clocked 6-8% higher than the 1600 out of the box. Then, like the rest of the Ryzen lineup, the 2600 is also an unlocked CPU, so reaching and even exceeding the stock 2600X performance shouldn't be an issue. So for our test setup, just a quick recap on that in case you missed the last 32 minute long review on the 2600X and 2700X, all data has been updated for the release of the second gen Ryzen CPUs. This means all data is fresh and has been gathered in the past two weeks. All testing was done with the latest drivers, Windows updates, motherboard BIOS updates, game and application updates, and security updates. Yes, the latest Spectre and Meltdown updates have been applied. Throughout the testing, we're looking at stock out-of-the-box performance as well as overclocking. The first-gen Ryzen CPUs have been overclocked to 4 GHz, while I was able to get the 2600X stable at 4.1 GHz and the 2700X at 4.2 GHz. The non-X2600, though, was able to boot into Windows and complete a number of tests, including Cinebench R15's multi-threaded test at 4.3 GHz using the same 1.375 volts that limited the 2600X to just 4.1 GHz. Unfortunately though, cranking the voltage right up still wasn't enough to allow us to stabilize the overclock at 4.3 GHz, uh, particularly for our heavy blender workload, and we were forced back down to 4.2 GHz. Something else worth noting was that the 2600 would suffer the dreaded blue screen of death when using our G-Skill SniperX DDR4-3400CL16 memory. The integrated controller just doesn't seem to be as good as what we found with the 2600X and 2700X. Therefore, I switched to G-Skill's Flare XDDR4-3200CL14 memory. Now, you don't really sacrifice much with this lower frequency memory due to the tighter timings. This integrated memory controller issue could just be a problem with my chip, or it could be more widespread uh, with all of the non-X models. Time will tell. Anyway, enough chit-chat. Let's get to the good stuff. First up, here's a quick look at sustained memory performance, and as you can see, the lower latency CL14 memory actually edges out the higher clock DDR4-3400CL16 memory used by the 2600X. So, despite using lower clocked memory, the Ryzen 5 2600 shouldn't be at a disadvantage, with the bandwidth creeping just over 39GB per second, it's got plenty to play with. Moving on to Cinebench R15, we see that the 2600 trails the 2600X by a 6% margin for both the single and multi-threaded tests. Still, out of the box, it was able to mimic the Core i7-7800X and improved on the older Ryzen 5 1600 single-thread score by a 9% margin and the multi-threaded score by an impressive 12% margin. 
Overclocked, it was able to edge out the slightly inferior 2600X chip, and I mean inferior in the sense that it only managed to get to 4.1 gigahertz. Uh, I suspect though we did get a poor chip. It seems like we have a similar situation to the 1600 and 1600X with the new 2600 and 2600X. Uh, both should be good for around the same type of overclock. Uh, in this case, it's about 4.1 to 4.2 gigahertz. Next up, we have the PC Mark 10 video editing results. And here we can see the stock Ryzen 5 2600 scores 4,901 points, which placed it only ahead of the R5 1600, but also just 2% behind the stock 2600X and Core i7-7800X. Overclocked to 4.2 GHz, the score jumped up by 12% to reach 5,509 points, and that's almost on par with the $330 Ryzen 7 2700X. So that's an exceptional result for the 2600. This time with the PC Mark gaming test, we see that when compared to the Ryzen 5 1600, the 2600 was 8% faster out of the box and 7% faster once both CPUs were overclocked to the max. Overclocked, the 2600 also matched the Ryzen 7 1800X, though due to a reduction in cores was 9% slower than the 2700X. Firing up Excel for some spreadsheet action, we see that the 2600 took just 3.1 seconds to complete the workload when stock, and just 2.6 seconds once overclocked. That means with both the 1600 and 2600 overclocked to the max, the new second gen model completed the workload 11% quicker. For compression and decompression work, the 2600 is 11% faster than the 1600, which is a seriously impressive improvement. This puts it almost on par with the Core i7-7800X, a CPU that costs almost twice as much. Then moving on, we find the 2600 did trail the 7800X by a rather large margin for our handbrake test, though once overclocked it did rapidly close in. Of course, you can still overclock the 7800X and we'll look at those results in a future video. Overall though, this is still a great result for AMD and we see that the 2600 is easily able to beat the 7700K clocked at five gigahertz. Running the Corona benchmark, we see that out of the box, the Ryzen 5 2600 and Core i7-7800X are comparable, which again bodes well for this significantly more affordable AMD CPU. Moving on to the Blender results, and we see here that the 2600 needs to be clocked at 4.2 GHz in order to beat the stock Core i7-7800X. Still, it is worth noting that before overclocking, the 2600 is still faster than the Core i7-7700K, which was clocked at 5 GHz, so in terms of value, it is still very impressive. The V-Ray benchmark shows the stock Ryzen 5 2600 shaving 11% off the render time when compared to the R5 1600. In fact, overclocked to the max, the R5 1600 is able to roughly match the stock 2600. Meanwhile, overclocking the second gen Ryzen CPU reduced the render time by a further 13%, allowing it to complete the test in 89 seconds. For content creators, on a budget, the Ryzen 5 2600 should be a hot item as you can achieve 8600K light performance at a more affordable price. Even at 5.2 gigahertz, the 8600K is only a fraction faster and at this frequency does require expensive cooling and a D-lid. Though please note our chip hasn't been d lidded and therefore does run extremely hot. I was really impressed to see that even when editing, the 2600 is comparable to the higher clocked 8600K, so it appears to have no real weakness and is considerably better than the first gen Ryzen 5 1600 for these types of lightly threaded workloads. And of course, that is down to the fact that it runs at a higher frequency when only using one to two cores. Okay, so now it's time to do some gaming. And first up, we have Ashes of the Singularity running with the DirectX 12 API. The Ryzen CPUs would fare a lot better in this title with a Radeon GPU as we've shown a number of times in the past. Unfortunately though, right now AMD just doesn't have anything competitive in the high end, so it makes more sense to test with the GTX 1080 Ti. Of course, we would like to test with both, it's just not possible due to time and all that sort of stuff. Anyway, in the case of the Ryzen 5 2600, it's still very respectable and overclocked edges out the stock 7700K and 7800X. It's also not a great deal slower than the 8 core 1800X and 2700X. Moving on to Assassin's Creed Origins using the high quality preset and we see that the 2600 is only slightly faster than the 1600 out of the box. That said, unlike the 1600, it does see a decent performance bump once overclocked, though something is limiting the AMD CPUs to around 98 FPS in this title. Uh, perhaps that could be the Nvidia display driver. Not 100% sure on that one, it's something I'll have to look into. 
Overclocked, the Ryzen 5 2600 is able to roughly match the Ryzen 7 2700X in Battlefield 1, and that meant that it was 8% faster than the 1600 maxed out at full gigahertz. So a decent step forward here for AMD, especially at the $200 price point. Reducing the GPU bottleneck by reducing the Battlefield 1 quality preset to the medium setting uh, does allow the overclocked 8700K and 8600K to run away with it. But still, before we overclocked the 2600, it allowed for over 100 FPS at all times anyway. Playing Far Cry 5, the overclock 2600 basically matched the overclock 2700X, and this made it one of the fastest Ryzen CPUs we've ever tested in this title. Although it does trail the Coffee Lake and KB Lake CPUs, with 100 FPS or more, it's still getting the job done nicely. Interestingly, the 6-core Ryzen CPUs do lag behind a little for the 1% low result in our 12-player bot match, and while overclocking the 2600 does help here, it still reaches the Overwatch frame cap. Moving on, we have Vermintide 2, and here we see with the extreme quality preset at 1080p, the Ryzen 5 2600 can almost get the most out of the GTX 1080 Ti. Overclocked, it was just 12% slower than the 8700K and 8600K, both of which were overclocked to 5.2 GHz. Reducing the GPU bottleneck with the medium quality preset does once again allow the Intel CPUs to run away with it, making them a better choice for high refresh rate gaming, as I've noted in the past. Then moving on to power consumption, here we're measuring the peak total system consumption using the Kabak PowerMate. Like the Core i5-8400 and Ryzen 5 1600, the 2600 sips very little power in our Ashes of the Singularity benchmark and it only drove total system consumption to just 370 watts. Overclocked we see an 11% increase to 411 watts which is really a great result for AMD. The 2600 again matched the Ryzen 5 1600, this time drawing 345 watts, and we see a 12% increase once overclocked, which is still less than the amount of power a stock 7800X draws. Here we see with the blender workload, the 2600 draws less power than the 1600, and again, overclock still consumes less power than a stock Core i7 7800X. The handbrake results though were a bit of an eye opener, and honestly, I was expecting to see more results that looked a bit like this when overclocking because usually we see overclocking just throwing efficiency out the window. Prior to any overclocking, the 2600 is extremely efficient. However, once we overclock it for this benchmark, total system consumption climbed by 88%, and the only chance we might have of seeing a worse result here would be if I overclocked the 7800X. Finally, we have the Premiere Encode results, and here the overclock 2600 increased total system consumption by just 28%. Considering the 8600K saw a 32% increase once overclocked, that's a decent result for the second gen Ryzen CPU. Now, let's talk temperatures. For testing, we maintained an ambient air temperature of 21 to 22 degrees, and the ASUS ROG Crosshair 7 Hero, along with the Ryzen 5 2600 and its box cooler, were placed in our Corsair Crystal 570X ATX test system. Under these conditions, the Wraith Stealth kept the R5 2600 at 74 degrees in our Blender stress test. Moving on to gaming, and we found under heavy load with utilization hovering between 80 and 90%, the temperatures peaked at just 63 degrees, and during more typical loads, dropped down to 59 degrees. So for stock performance, the little Wraith Stealth does quite a good job. Uh, it's also very quiet. For our 4.2 GHz overclock, we did strap on the Corsair H150i Pro, and this saw a peak temperature when running an hour-long blender workload reached to 67 degrees. Then when gaming, we saw temperatures peak at 56 degrees, but it is worth noting that for the most part, they were below 50 degrees. As for overclocking with the box cooler, I was able to reach 4 GHz using 1.23 volts, but did hit a temperature of 87 degrees in our Blender stress test after an hour. For gaming, you could afford to push things a little further, but if you're doing any kind of heavy workloads, 4 GHz is probably the limit here. Finally, for those of you wondering, stock the Ryzen 5 2600 holds an all-core clock speed of 3.65 GHz using the Wraith Stealth box cooler. Then upgrading to the H150i Pro saw the all-core frequency jump up to 3.75 GHz for the intense hour-long stress test. We found the same 100 MHz increase for the 2600X and 2700X when upgrading from the included box coolers. 
Last year, I declared the Ryzen 5 1600 as the best value CPU on the market. Uh, whether you're a gamer or you've actually got some real work to do, few rivaled what the 1600 had to offer at the $200 US price point. Of course, the Core i5-8400 is an attractive option and arguably the better gaming CPU, certainly for today's games, but when it comes to core heavy workloads, the 1600 just ran away with it, and for that reason, I really felt that it was the better all-rounder. Now we have the Ryzen 5 2600, and it's offering, I suppose what you could call an incremental upgrade to the previous model, and really that's probably all it had to do. Uh, for those that bought a Ryzen 5 1600 uh, early this year or last year, well, they're not gonna be upgrading to the 2600. They'll probably even hold off on jumping to the 2700X. But for those of you who are building a new PC now, you have the choice between a Coffee Lake Core i5 or a second gen Ryzen 5 processor, and this incremental update has really helped make Ryzen a more attractive than it was previously. The 2600 is also a nice upgrade option for those who purchased a quad-core first-gen Ryzen processor. The only disappointing aspect of the Ryzen 5 2600 is the fact that AMD downgraded the bundle to only include the Wraith Stealth Cooler. If only the Wraith Spire was included, but for that you will need to pony up an extra $30 US for the 2600X model. AMD's been a bit smarter this time around with the X models. Still, the 2600 is 13% cheaper and was at most 7% slower, so in terms of value, it is still the more cost-effective option. As for the ASUS ROG Crosshair 7 Hero, it's a seriously nice X470 motherboard, and with the latest BIOS, version 509, it worked like a charm. Of course, as I said earlier in the review, it's better suited to use with, say, Ryzen 7 models. Uh, for the 2600, I'd recommend something like the ASUS Prime X470 Pro or the Tough X470 Plus Gaming. Hopefully I can check those boards out for you guys in a future video. At the time of putting this video together, the Ryzen 5 2600 sat in 23rd position on Amazon's bestseller list, while the Ryzen 7 2700X claimed second spot behind the 8700K, and the R5 1600 was one position from standing on the podium in fourth. It's pretty shocking to see how far back the R5 2600 currently is, but that might have to do with AMD refusing to supply samples or even let retailers hand them over to us under embargo ahead of the release. They obviously wanted their more expensive X models front and center. Personally though, I do prefer the cheaper Ryzen 5 2600 to the more expensive 2600X, as I'd be upgrading the cooler regardless of which version I purchased, and the low latency DDR4 3200 memory seems like the way to go. But let me hand this one over to you guys. Which model appears to be uh, best for you? The 2600 or the 2600X? Please let me know in the comments below. And that is gonna do it for this one. If you enjoyed the video, please hit the like button, subscribe for more content. If you appreciate the work we do here at Harbour Unbox, then consider supporting us on Patreon. You'll gain access to our Discord chat where Tim and myself are always hanging out. And you get access to our monthly live stream and the occasional behind the scenes video. In the most recent behind the scenes video, we cut up some timber and Tim went barefoot. It's pretty wild stuff. Anyway, thanks for watching. I'm your host, Steve, and I'll see you again next time.